Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me the slides of my presentation. Um, distinguished colleagues, the presentation is about uh, conflict origins development developments and perception of the very complex problem of Nagorno-Karabakh, its status um, and uh, related issues. Please, the next one. Yes. A very brief glimpse in not too deep history, starting with the 16th century because at that time, the demographic composition of Nagorno-Karabakh, or of Karabakh, better to say, changed because of the first settlement of Turkmen and Kurds by Iranian Shah in the Kura Plain in Lower Karabakh. In the 18th century, <clears throat> we have the united land of the five princes, or Meliks, Mahale Khamse, a semi-autonomy which was respected by Iran. And in 1747, Prince Panach declares himself the first non-Armenian, non-Muslim prince or Melik of uh, Shoshi, um, which is in the very center of Nagorno-Karabakh. In 1805, the Turkish, Turkic governor of the Persian Khanate of Karabakh, Ibrahim Khan, hands over <coughs> the region to the sovereignty of Russia, and Nagorno-Karabakh becomes a protectorate of the Russian Empire by the Kurekchai Treaty. Another treaty, the Iranian-Russian Treaty of Gulistan of October 1813, uh, incorporates Karabakh officially into the Russian Empire. And then in 1846, Russia formally recognizes the Melik Armenian nobility. The princes of Karabakh enter the Russian Imperial Civil Service. From 1864 to 1910, the Russian policy towards Armenians and Armenia is in particular ambivalent. Armenians are considered schismatics and revolutionaries. And the uh, slogan, Armenia without Armenians, is not emerging from Ottoman Turkey or from the COP, but from a Russian ambassador and uh, foreign minister Alexei lobanov rostovsky the next, please. Next slide. The next slide shows the united land of the five Meliks, Mahale Khamse, with its four, uh, sorry, five semi-autonomous principalities in comparison to the borders of the later autonomous region of Nagorno-Karabakh. And clearly we can see that the autonomous region was just the central third of the entire territory, leaving outside its borders uh, huge parts in the north in particular, in the east and also in the west. Divide et impera was the slogan of the Russian uh, administrative policy uh, without any regard to ethnic and linguistic um, agglomerations. Nagorno-Karabakh then belonged to the province of Elizabeth Pol, despite the wishes of Armenians to have it incorporated into the province or government of Yerevan. The next, please. The early 20th century brought the collapse of the Russian Empire. It brought crisis, transformation, 
and massacres. The first Armenian Tatar war, as it was called at the time in 1905, also brought uh, riots against minorities. And then the second uh, Armenian Tatar war in the period of 1918 to 1920 saw larger massacres, in particular in Baku in 1918, with 30,000 Armenian victims. And in the capital, the historical capital of Karabakh in Shushi, with 20,000 in March 1920. The uh, Azerbaijani nationalism, which was emerging in that period of 1918 to 20, was a child of British and Soviet Russian diplomacy directed against pan-Islamic or pan-Turkish, that is pan ogus concepts. The status of Karabakh remained open. In late 1918, by the British, it was made a temporary general government of, Nag of Karabakh and Zangezur. And at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, there was no settlement of the status question, but also no permanent recognition of Azerbaijani supremacy over Nagorno-Karabakh, the next. Um, the, under Soviet rule, Karabakh was a bargaining chip for Soviet-Russian alliance policy. It was first promised to Armenia in December 1920, as well as still on the 12th of June 1921. But already in December 1920, Kemalist Turkey protested in Moscow against the handover of Nakhichevan, Zangezur, and Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. On the 5th of July 1921, Karabakh eventually was awarded to Azerbaijan. And two years later, when the borders were set, the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomous region excluded northern Armenian settlement areas. And also there emerged a conflict-prone corridor, the notorious corridor of Lachin. Economically and culturally, Soviet Azerbaijan neglected purposely Karabakh, which caused immigration, massive immigration of the working population. And that all together resulted in the Karabakh Armenian protest movement of 1987, emerging first in the northern district of Shaomyan, under the slogan Miyatsum unification and under the conditions of Pirestroika. But the Armenian irredentist objectives failed. So that the Soviet of the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region decided in February 1988 to demand that the Supreme Soviets of the USSR, the Armenian and the Azerbaijani Soviet Republics, agree to the Armenian majority's request to join the Armenian Soviet Republic. And that was followed by renewed Armenian massacres in Sumgait, in Ganja, Kirovabad at the time, Baku and elsewhere. In September 1991, following Azerbaijan's declaration of independence, Nagorno-Karabakh declared itself independent from Azerbaijan. The next slide, please. Uh, very briefly, I return to the Sumgait atrocity crimes of 1988, quoting from the book Black Garden of Thomas Duval, where he described the massacres of Sumgait as gangs ranging in size from about a dozen to more than 50 roamed around, smashing windows, burning cars, but above all looking for Armenians to attack. The roving gangs committed acts of horrific savagery, 
Several victims were so badly mutilated by excess that their bodies could not be identified. Women were stripped naked and set on fire. Several were raped repeatedly. The next one, please. Also, the Operation Ring has to be mentioned, uh, which lasted from March to June 1991. Uh, it was a combined um, military action by Azerbaijani Interior Ministry troops, the regular 23rd Soviet Army, and Azerbaijani civilians who expelled inhabitants of 23 Armenian villages in and around Nagorno-Karabakh with brutal force. A forced resettlement of a total of up to 32,000 people took place and up to 170 casualties occurred. Approximately 600 Armenians were kidnapped as civilian hostages. The next, please. From December 1991, following a referendum in Nagorno-Karabakh, up to May 1994, Azerbaijan attempted to reconquest Nagorno-Karabakh, resulting in 40,000 war dead, more than the half of them being Armenians, mostly civilians. About 80,000 Armenian and 40,000 Azeri war refugees emerged from Nagorno-Karabakh. And up to 700,000 war refugees or IDPs from seven neighboring districts. At the end of 2018, according to Azerbaijani official government figures, there were still 640,000 IDPs in Azerbaijan. Lower were an estimate of the U.S. Committee for Refugees from 2005, but still being more than half a million, of which about 420,000 IDPs emerged from the districts bordering on the former uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region. The situation of the IDPs depends on um, their social status. Most of them are still depending on uh, social transfer pay payments and complain about poor housing conditions. So that the desire to return depends on the generation of the IDPs and in particular on their integration successes, which are low. There's an unstable ceasefire and no lasting peace settlement. The next one, please. <laughs> A brief look on the current situation shows this map. Uh, marked in brown are the areas controlled by Armenian forces, combined forces from the republics of Armenia and uh, Artsakh. Red are the borders of the previous uh, autonomous region, and we can see that again in the north and very east, um, the areas are not controlled by Armenian forces, but by Azerbaijan. The next one, please. A factor of conflict aggravation, as I already indicated, are the unintegrated IDPs. And this table shows that most of them would live in the capital city, Baku, and <clears throat> more than 100,000 in other regions, whereas the remaining parts are uh, partly resettled, tens of thousands of IDPs, in areas bordering the front line. And that uh, this proximity to the front line puts them in particular danger, which is certainly an intent by the responsible Azerbaijani government. The next one.
Another factor of conflict aggravation is the arms build up and arms raise. They increase in annual expenditure on the military budget, both in Armenia and Azerbaijan, both countries, according to the Global Militarization Index, belong to the 10 states which spend most of their budget and the highest amount on uh, military expenses. Azerbaijan is a driving force here since 2004 and reached a peak in 2015 with nearly 5 billion US dollar expenditure on the military budget. That has uh, decreased um, following the decrease of uh, the market price for oil. Um, this year, Azerbaijan spent uh, nevertheless more than two billions in euro uh, on uh, military purposes, whereas the Armenian amount was uh, 631 million US dollar. The next, please. Um, if we compare both countries uh, for the indicators of uh, territories and populations, we see a clear asymmetry between Armenia and Artsakh on the one side, Azerbaijan on the other. The next, please. Um, coming to perceptions, there are interesting structural commonalities. Armenians and Azeris see themselves or see Armenians see Azeris and Azeris see themselves as Turks. One nation in two states was a slogan uh, shaped by Ilham Aliyev. Um, secondly, both nations see themselves as victims of mutual genocide. Um, the Armenians see themselves as, as victims of pan-Turkish genocide and expulsion and the Azeris as victims of Armenian genocide and expulsions. And both uh, nations are familiar with irredentism. In the Armenian case, it is the longing for unification of the Artsakh and Armenian republics whereas uh, Azeris have um, more uh, demanding goals. The Azeri irredentism would be the unification of South, that is Iranian, and North Azerbaijan. The next one. Eventually, eventually I come to an attempt of a human rights assessment of all the facts uh, during the at least the last 30 years. Crimes against humanity, according to the Rome Statutes of 1998, Article 7, Paragraph 1, have been committed, mass murder, torture, rape, forced resettlement and deportation, and group persecution based solely on ethnicity. War crimes, mm. There are air raids and bombing of the unfortified and unprotected, unprotected capital Stepanakert during 1991 to 92 and numerous villages during the already mentioned Operation Ring. Currently, military attacks on civilian facilities such as schools, kindergartens, hospitals have to be mentioned and the use of cluster and phosphor bombs. And a third uh, important factor in the legal context is the impunity of perpetrators during 1988 and 1991. In 1993, post-Soviet Azerbaijan declared an amnesty of about 100 mostly juvenile offenders of the Sumgait Pogrom of 1988. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>